Hello, and welcome to this Makes Methodists at Service Together for Sunday, the 27th of June, 2021. I'm Sean Turner. I'm the Methodist minister for the south of the island here in the Isle of Man. And it is great to be with you. And this is an amazing week. Uh, if you have very good eyesight and happen to notice that, yes, it is June, and yes, I am wearing a Christmas tie, because just a couple of days ago, we passed the halfway point to Christmas. So we are celebrating that uh, today, as well as looking at Mark's account of the empty tomb. Uh, and as I like to say, the Easter story is the Christmas story, and the Christmas story is the Easter story. And as everybody who knows me will tell you, I will find a way to work Christmas into about anything. But in the Methodist Church, we have been working our way through Bible Month during June. And the uh, book for this year was the Gospel of Mark. And each Sunday, we've taken one quarter of that gospel and, and either looked at sort of the theme that ran through that part of the gospel or just one part. And today we're looking at one part, uh, which is chapter 16 and the first eight verses and the women going to the empty tomb. We are hoping that you will be blessed in this time today and that God will speak to you as we worship together. Eternal God, hallowed be your name. Early in the morning, before we begin our work, we praise your glory. Renew our bodies as fresh as the morning flowers. Open our inner eyes as the sun casts new light upon the darkness. Deliver us from all captivity. Like the birds of the sky, give us wings of freedom to begin a new journey. As a mighty stream running continuously, restore justice and freedom day by day. We thank you for the gift of this morning and a new day to work with you. God of love, God for all, your purposes are more beautiful than we can possibly imagine. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us let go of all that holds us back. Open our lives and our churches to new seasons of humility and faith, of change and growth. Shake us up with the good news of Jesus and show us the way. Amen. Jesus is risen, alleluia. Worship and praise him, alleluia. Now our Redeemer burst from the grave. Lost to the tomb, Christ rises to save. Come, let us worship him and let me sing. Christ is alive and death possesses its sting. Sins are forgiven, alleluia. Jesus is risen, alleluia. Buried for three days, destined for death. Now he returns to breathe with our breath. Blessed are the ears alert to his voice. Blessed are the hearts which for him rejoice. Come, let us worship him and let me sing. Christ is alive and death causes its sting. Sins are forgiven, alleluia. Jesus is risen, alleluia. Don't be afraid, the angel had said. Why seek the living here with the dead? Look where he lay, his body is gone. Risen and vibrant, warm as the sun. Come, let us worship him and let me sing. Christ is alive and death loses its sting. Sins are forgiven, alleluia. Jesus is risen, alleluia. Tell us. 
Brothers, Christ is alive. Love is eternal, faith, hope, and thrive. What God intended, Jesus fulfilled. What God conceives can never be killed. How let us worship him endlessly sing. Christ is alive and death loses its sting. Sins are forgiven, hallelujah. Jesus is risen, hallelujah. has arisen, now all can see how humankind is meant to be free. Though paths of darkness threaten their worst, through every barrier Jesus has burst. Our lives must worship him endlessly sing. Christ is alive and death loses its sting. Sins are forgiven, alleluia. Jesus is risen, alleluia. Jesus is Saviour of everything. All those who trust him, Christ will receive. Therefore rejoice, obey, and believe. Come, let us worship him and let me sing. Christ is alive and death loses its sting. Sins are forgiven, alleluia. Jesus is risen, alleluia. Heavenly Father, as we bring our prayers to you, the words of Mark's account still echo in our thoughts. Go, tell his disciples and Peter. Lord, help us both to extend and to accept the hand of friendship and forgiveness where relationships are strained or broken. It's so easy to bear grudges and dwell on grievances. But you, Lord, gave us your supreme example by including Peter, even after he had let you down. And sometimes we just need to be patient, Lord, while we wait for a response. And that's not very easy. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. How often fear is the thing which holds us back from speaking out. We thank you, Lord, for those who are not afraid to speak both throughout the ages and in our own time. To cry out for justice and mercy in our world, where all too often injustice and intolerance prevail. To speak out in defence of our beautiful planet, your creation, which we so carelessly exploit. To speak the truth to power and to boldly proclaim your risen power to all. We pray, Lord, for the leaders of the nations as they guide the way forward. Grant them wisdom, grant them courage. We pray especially for our own island as border restrictions change, visitors return, and we are all unsure of the future. For businesses, as they adapt to new norms and new challenges. We pray, Lord, for the places where life is tough, for places where medical care and vaccines are not available and the future looks bleak. Help us to learn to share and support each other so that the whole world may benefit together. We pray, Lord, for places where warfare and violence are commonplace. Father, forgive us for our complacency and our unwillingness to cry, Enough! And on this conference Sunday... We pray for those attending in whatever way that is possible. That discussions should be fruitful and loving and that decisions should be guided by you. Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Amen. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? And when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. I don't know if it still is, but it used to be a, a tradition that a good sermon, you know, a good sermon was a three point sermon. It had you, you made three points as you went through the sermon. And so if we're using that definition, then today's sermon is a good traditional sermon because it has three points to it. Uh, but all three of those points actually come from the last two verses that we heard today from verses seven and eight. And, and we will work our way through that. But here uh, at the end of June, at the end of Bible month, we are at the end, or maybe I should say at an end, of Mark's Gospel. Because if you look in your Bible at Mark 16 and you look at verses 1 to 8, you may notice that there are, you know, some more verses, that we're only halfway through chapter 16. So how can this be the end of Mark's Gospel? But your Bible probably also has some notes that says, you know, this is the uh, shorter ending, traditional ending, and then you have the longer ending of Mark, which actually has the resurrection appearances recorded in it. But as near as we can tell, Mark's gospel in its original form ended at verse 8, which may seem a little odd in that, you know, Jesus has been resurrected, but nobody's seen him yet. But we are going to come back to that and, and look at how actually that would fit with how Mark has, has written his gospel. So, traditional three-point sermon, point one, uh, actually is in the last verse. In the last verse, we're told this. So the women went out and they fled the tomb, for terror and amazement had filled them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. 
Now, every time I read this verse, I have such empathy for those women. I mean, of course they're terrified. I mean, can you imagine what it'd be like if, if you decided one day you were going to go to the cemetery and you were going to visit the grave site of somebody that you loved dearly and you got there and the grave was all dug up and, and gone. I mean, there's, it's empty. I mean, what would that feel like? I mean, I can easily see some fear, some amazement, and maybe, you know, after things had settled in, I can also see some anger coming in, like who would dare do this? I mean, they no more expected to get to that tomb and find it empty than it seems we do today. You know, for these women, it's Sunday morning, and just on Friday afternoon, their world had ended when Jesus had been crucified. I mean, they just, this was so horrendous and unexpected. It's like, how do you cope with that? And then, and then they come to the tomb and it's empty. And it's like, well, well, where's Jesus? And we'll come back to the angel, but you know, the angel is there and they hear what he has to say. And they went out and fled from the tomb. Now, Fled from the tomb. I'm going to give you a good American word from the 1800s. This was really popular in our Civil War. So what these women did was they skedaddled. Okay, when you skedaddle, you, you, you're you like, you know, your legs are going faster than you never thought possible. You're not carrying anything that's going to slow you down. I mean, you are skedaddling. You are out of here. You know, feet don't fail me now. You're gone. So they are, you know, in that contest of fight or flight. There's no contest here. It is pure flight. They are getting out of there. And the last thing that Mark tells us then, after they skedaddle, is they say nothing to anyone for they were afraid. So what had the angel told them to do? Well, the angel had told them, look, go tell his disciples and Peter. Okay, here, I have a message for you to deliver. Now, obviously, there comes a point when they do tell somebody, because if they never told anybody, we wouldn't know this story. So maybe it was, you know, later in the day when people had started seeing Jesus around, as we know from the other accounts, maybe it was even a day or two later, maybe, you know, after they themselves had an encounter with the risen Christ. But for now, their lips are sealed. They're not going to tell anybody. And it's easy to understand why. I mean, have you ever kept quiet? <laughs> because what you might have said, you thought might have made you sound a little crazy, a little cuckoo. I mean, even one of the other gospels tells us that the women, they come from the tomb and they tell the disciples he is risen and it seemed to them an idle tale. I mean, what a wonderful line. It seemed to them an idle tale. I mean, you, you people are seeing things. You're, you're loony. I mean, it, it's an idle tale. But, but yeah, we don't believe that for a minute. But what if they had never told anyone? I, I, I think it's pretty obvious that word would have gotten out anyway because... You know, Jesus was seen by so many people, not just on Easter, but in the days to come. But, you know, they are so terrified. Their lips are sealed. And, you know, reminded me of one of those lines from the epistles where the questions asked, how will they believe if they have not heard? And how will they hear if no one tells them? You know, we live in a culture now that tells us that faith is something that should be kept private. It's, it's not polite conversation in public. But you know, the reality is that faith has never been private. Faith has been passed down from generation to generation, usually by the mothers and the grandmothers. And it has formed the fabric, part of the fabric of our society. It's part of the weaving that goes on that makes society. 
Yes, Jesus says, go into your room and close the door and pray in, in secret and your heavenly father who sees in secret. But you know, Jesus's ministry was not done in secret. It was done in public. He was out there in the temple, in the courtyards, in people's houses, in the countryside. I mean, it's, it's really that Methodist thing of personal holiness and social gospel, where it's our personal spirituality and working to make a better and just society. And if we have forgotten what those things are, personal holiness and social gospel, then I invite you to look it up. Google is your friend. Uh, I'm sure you'll find lots of things about how Methodism began and these stresses that we would do well to reclaim. A friend of mine some years ago was standing on a train platform and he and another guy were going to a church conference and they were talking about what would happen at this conference or wondering what would happen at this conference. And this lady on the platform, also waiting for the train, walked up to them and said, you should not be talking about that in public. You should not be talking about church in public. As a preacher, you know, preachers have been told many times, don't bring politics into the pulpit. The trouble with that is, Jesus was not shy about confronting politics when it was unjust or when it was just downright evil. So I get the temptation to be quiet, and I really get the temptation to be quiet. You see, by, by nature, I mean, people who only see me in the pulpit or when I'm preaching find this hard to believe, but I am a shy introvert. Those are two different things, but I'm both. I'm a shy introvert. And quiet is how I like it. I mean, I, I don't like a ruckus, you know, it's just, ugh. But you know, the reality is that how we live our lives, the choices we make, the things we do, the things we don't do, that will proclaim our faith far louder than any words we could ever use. So point the first of this three-point sermon is very simple. Don't be afraid to live out your faith in public. It's very simply and easily done. Just be a disciple. So point the second. The first part of this message that the angel gives to the women. Go tell his disciples and Peter. Now, have you ever wondered about why that's written the way it's written. Because it says, go tell his disciples, and then says, and Peter. Well, isn't Peter a disciple? I mean, isn't Peter the disciple? Didn't Jesus say, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church? Yes. What did Jesus also say to Peter? Just a couple of days before, Jesus had said, Peter, I tell you, before the cock crows, you will have denied even knowing me three times. See, a disciple follows Jesus. A disciple doesn't deny Jesus, certainly doesn't deny even knowing who Jesus is. So it seems like what the angel is saying here is that Peter has separated himself from the disciples when he denied even knowing Jesus. We're going to come back to that in a minute, but for now, just, just think about these things. Have you ever kept quiet about your faith? You know, maybe because it would be embarrassing or maybe because it would just be plain scary. I mean, you know, just to imagine that you're with a group of people and, you know, and friends, and they somehow get on this subject talking about, you know, oh, those Christians, they are all hypocrites, all these hypocritical Christians. And, you know, you have an opportunity just to simply say, well, you know, I'm a Christian. Do, do you think I'm a hypocrite? Or, you know, don't even make it personal. Just say, well, you know, I'm a Christian. I mean, how do you think we're hypocrites? I mean, what have you seen? Or they go on and talk about, oh, you know, that nonsense that Christians believe. I mean, they're just crazy. Oh, well... Like what? 
I mean, what, what, what kind of nonsense is this? I mean, but in order for us to actually ask questions and have a conversation about things like that, we have to be grounded enough and secure enough in our own faith that we can have those conversations. We have to know enough about what we believe that we can talk about what we believe. And sometimes it is so easy to be quiet because you don't want to make waves. You just want to get out of there as soon as you can. You're like the women fleeing from the tomb. And like Peter, say nothing, do nothing, leave it to somebody else. Just, just don't say anything. Don't admit to knowing him. So point the second, let's work on our spiritual life and growth and start in what should be the easiest way possible. Talk about God. Talk about Jesus. Talk about the Holy Spirit with other disciples. I mean, can we at least talk about God in church with people who go to church? Which means that we're invited to show up more than just on Sunday, to have small groups, to have times when we get together for fellowship, maybe go out for a meal, and don't be afraid to talk about things. Ask the questions that you carry that you'd really like to know the answer to, especially those questions that you think you can ask, because you know what? You can. And point the third, the message that they're to give to the disciples and to Peter, that he, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. Now, if Mark ends here at verse 8, it ends by sending the disciples to Galilee. Now, what this does, actually, is tell the disciples to go back to the beginning. See, think about Mark as a cycle, a full circle. And we have come all the way around. See, if you go back to Mark chapter 1, go back to the beginning, you have an intro to John the Baptist. Then Jesus appears and is baptized. Jesus goes into the wilderness where he is tempted. And then Mark tells us this. Then Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. So it's like the way Mark has set this gospel up is the angel is saying, go back to the beginning, go back to Galilee and start again. Go back to Galilee and live the story again. The healings, the miracles, the ministry, the teaching. Learn again and again and again what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, and then follow him. Now that you know the whole story, live it again and again and again. So yes, there are times in which we are going to be scared, and there are times in which we will deny him, and there will be times in which we will make an absolute choice. Okay, right now, I'm not going to live as a disciple. I'm going to do this or I'm not going to do that. But the hope is that if we keep trying, if we keep going back to Galilee and living the whole story again and learning and learning and learning and practicing and practicing and getting a little better and a little better, we just, as year follows on year, as I like to say, we get better at being a disciple. And Jesus still walks with us. I mean, note that even though Peter may have separated himself from the disciples at this point, he's not cast out. The message of the resurrection is not just for the disciples. It's for Peter as well. He's not forgotten. He's still going to be that rock on which the church is going to be built. 
The good news of the resurrection is for him, even when he denied knowing who Jesus is. You know, there is nothing that we can do that puts us forever and always beyond the saving and redemptive power of God. As I like to say to my, uh, of myself, I am a work in progress. John Wesley would say, we are going on to perfection. So point the third, keep at it. Just keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. And we'll get a little better and a little better and a little better. So our homework is basically those three points. Don't keep faith private. Work on spiritual growth and start with fellow disciples. And just keep at it. And Jesus is going to keep walking with you and keep teaching you and keep helping you no matter how many times each one of us has to make that journey from Galilee to Jerusalem and back again. We'll just keep making that journey together again and again as, as many times as it takes. It's not about standing on a roadside wearing a sign. It's not about taking out a full page ad in the paper. It's about how we live with our friends and our families and our neighbors, about whether or not our life is defined by love. It's about whether we do something to care for the widow, the orphan, and the alien in our midst. You know, we have all these opportunities around us. We have food bank. We have fair trade stalls. We have opportunities to campaign against unjust laws or unjust banking practices. We can work for affordable housing, COVID vaccines for everybody. I mean, the list, the opportunities, it just goes on and on and on. So this end of Mark, it's an opportunity. It's an absolute opportunity. It is a chance to begin again and share in the life and ministry of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Son of the living God. So to my fellow works in progress, let's make today a new beginning and follow Jesus as he continues to teach us and show us what it means to live the love of God. Amen. my soul the greatness of the Lord unnumbered blessings give my spirit voice tender to me the promise of his words in God my Savior shall my heart rejoice Hello. Uh -huh.
Blessing based on a prayer by St. Ambrose. Lord, take from us our hearts of stone and give us hearts of flesh, hearts to love and adore you, to delight in you, to enjoy you, and to follow you. Amen.